So I was down at the family video store in Mustang this week and I was picking up a copy of, well, you'll see it there in front of you, Bridge of Spies. It's a movie, a Tom Hanks movie, and um, was trying to get a copy of it to review it for this week's sermon. And I got the copy and I headed over to the checkout stand and there was a young woman behind it. And I laid it down there and she looked at it. And she said, oh, wow, that, that's a great movie. I just, I just looked at that a while back. Man, that's an exciting movie. And it tells you how it was back, way back in those days. And I said, 1960. She said, yeah, way back in those days. Uh, and I said, it's kind of like Jurassic Park, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, so anyway, she says this and I, she says, yeah, and it really tells you the tension and, you know, uh, how people were afraid and stuff like that going on. I said, I know exactly what you mean. I remember, for instance, I remember uh, the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis when I was just a little kid, and I remember how frightened my mom and dad were that a nuclear war was about to break out. And she looked at me and said, man, you must have been really young when that took place. And so I gave her $5 for that, you know, got a little tip there. And, and uh, then I said, but you know, it's, it was really bad. For instance, we did the duck and cover drills at school, you know, got down under our desk and covered up so that we would be protected from a nuclear bomb. I didn't think that would protect us much from a nuclear bomb, but that's what they told us to do. And then I looked at her and I said, how old are you? And she says, I'm 30. And I said to her, you don't even remember the Soviet Union, do you? No, uh, I, it was born like right at the time that it broke up or afterwards. And you don't remember what it was like to have kind of in the back of your mind from time to time that in 30 to 45 minutes, you and everyone you knew could be dead and everything you knew could be gone. And that was a real possibility. No, I don't, I don't remember that. I said, that's what it was like. It was a time of fear and anxiousness at what had, might happen, you know, 17 years or so after 71 million people had been killed in World War II. It's a tense time. Now this movie deals with that time and it deals with what happens with a guy by the name of James Donovan. Donovan was an attorney in Brooklyn and in this true story, uh, he uh, is asked to represent Rudolf Abel who was a uh, Russian spy who was captured uh, and to, pres to represent him in the US court system uh, and subsequently also uh, Abel was taken to uh, West Berlin where he was to negotiate the hostage swap, the exchange, the ransom, uh, letting go Abel, the Russian spy, in order to get back Gary Powers. The, you may remember Gary Powers, the U-2 spy plane pilot who was shot down over Russia and also in the process uh, Donovan wanted to get back this guy by the name of Frederick Pryor who was a young college student that the uh, East Germans had uh, put in jail. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a story about some significant events, but really the core of the story is not so much about the events as it is who this man, James Donovan, was. And if I would describe it in this movie and in real life as well, uh, James Donovan would be described as a man of principle, a man who believed in standing up for his principles. And one of the principles that he stood up for, I guess I would call it the rule of law. Now the rule of law goes back uh, literally into the scriptures uh, if not before that, uh, in the scriptures, for instance, if you look at uh, the uh, jo Gospel of John at one point, Nicodemus uh, standing before the uh, Sanhedrin there, and the Sanhedrin is talking about getting, uh, arresting Jesus and putting him to death, and, and Nicodemus asks these people, he says, are we going to, does our law judge a man without first hearing what he has to say? In other words, don't we first have to hear him and get testimony from him before according to the law we can condemn him? Or looking back in the Old Testament where it says that the foreigner in your gates, says the scripture, the foreigner in your gates has the same rights as the Israelite citizen. Or look back in the scripture and look at how many times it's said over and over again, portrayed over and over again, that no, not even the king, not even the queen are above the law of God. That they're under the law of God and when they tried to act as though they were above the law of God, God sends prophets to them to challenge them on that and also things come and happen upon Israel that get them back, drive them back into the right way. This idea of the rule of law is as deep as scripture. And so here's James Donovan. He, he believes in the rule of law. He believes in equal justice under the law. He believes that everyone is innocent until proven guilty. He believes in that everyone has constitutional rights. Even foreigners have constitutional rights because they're in our gates, as the scripture says. 
and he's asked to represent this guy. Now that's not a popular task back in those days, to represent a Soviet spy. But he's willing to do it to make a stand for principle. And so he goes to meet with this, this guy, uh, Rudolf Abel, and there, this is a conversation I want to show you is a conversation between the two of them, James Donovan, the attorney, and, and Rudolf Abel, the spy that he's representing. And Abel cannot quite imagine what this guy is trying to pull. I mean, he's used to Soviet-style justice, and, and he thinks that, uh, you know, Donovan is there representing the CIA trying to pull something, and Donovan is trying to tell him, no, I don't work for the government, I work for you. I represent you to the best of my ability. Listen to this first uh, conversation. That's a great line you hear several times in this movie. This is a big, this is big trouble. Would it help for me to worry about it? Does it help to worry about it? Nah. Okay, so he's, Donovan's gonna stand for his principles, even with this guy who's, he's, you know, pretty confident. He's a Soviet spy, looking for atomic secrets. And as I was watching that, I thought to myself, okay, so if he's willing to do that for his principle, what should a Christian do? What principles should we stand for? What principles should the church stand for? Yeah, I was thinking about, for instance, where in Acts of the Apostles, Apostle Peter gets up and he, he says to this group of basically hostile people there in Jerusalem, he says, I want you to understand that there is no other name. And he's talking about the name of Jesus. There is no other name by which you must be saved. He says, this is what the church believes. The way, the truth, and the life is Jesus. This is where we take our stand. Or I, I think about not simply that, but sometimes in the moral stance that a Christian is called to take in life. For instance, when at work you're being pressured to do something that you know is not legal or you know is not particularly ethical, would you be willing to take a stand against that for the name of Jesus? Or when your friends, for instance, are, are gossiping about and running down somebody else, would you be willing to say, hey, look, I'm a Christian. I can't, I can't be involved in that kind of stuff. I'm not going to run down people. Take a stand for Jesus? Where could you take a stand for Jesus this week that would make a difference? Now, I need for you to understand that when you take a stand for the Lord, it has costs. You see that uh, aspect really in this movie uh, where it costs this guy by the name of Donovan in a variety of ways. For instance, it costs him in his relationships at the law firm that he's working at where his, uh, his uh, senior partner is trying to kind of undermine what he's trying to do, trying to get him out of that. Don't do that. Don't be so fervent in your defense of this guy. Or, or in the judge, they're in the chambers with the judge that's going to try this trial about this spy. And, and the judge is sitting there, and the judge says, look, he says, I understand. We all understand this guy's guilty. Yeah, we're going to give him due process, and then we're going to find him guilty. Or the community where he's hated for what he's doing. Or the cost in his family. There's a cost there in your family. In this next scene, I want to show you his daughter. You'll see his daughter, a teenage daughter, is laying there on the couch, listening, watching TV. Watch the cost that it had for this man in his life in 1962. At one point in the movie, his wife says to him, there is a cost for these things. There is a cost for what you're doing when you're standing up for this guy, for, when you're standing up for the rule of law. And as she said that, I thought to myself, but anyway, isn't that exactly what Jesus said? He says, if you're going to follow me, you've got to count the what? The cost. There's a cost for following me. It's not going to be kind of like a free ride. There's a cost for following me. You know, as I was thinking about that, I was reminded of something that happened to me last week. My wife and I, we went out to, uh, uh, to Portland, Oregon. We flew out there, and then we went over to the beach because my wife, you know, she loves the beach, and she loves the forest. And I don't love the beach, and I don't love the forest, but that's another story. But, but you were going out there to be, you know, where she wants to be, and it's a great experience. And, and we're in this little fishing coast uh, town, and... And we're staying there at this little place, and I go down one evening to the uh, local market to get something to make for supper, and, and I'm down there in the local market, and I'm pulling the, you know, pushing the cart around this little town market, and, 
And I, uh, it's kind of interesting what happens next because on the flight out there, I was sitting next to this guy and he and I were talking and at one point he asked me, what do you do? And I say, I kind of grimace because I know this gets interesting responses. I say, I'm a pastor and he, he goes, really? Like that? Yeah. And he says, I used to, you know, I grew up in Portland, Oregon. Do you realize that in Portland, Oregon, there are more, percentage wise, there are more atheists in Portland, Oregon than any other city in the United States? I said, no. He said, yeah, he says, and I says, I'm not talking about people who, who they, they uh, just don't believe in God. I'm talking about people who are aggressive atheists who will get up in your face and attack you. He said, really? So here I, am at, here I am out in this little market out there on the coast, and I'm pushing my cart around, and I get to the potato chip section. As I turn into the potato chip section, this guy and this woman, they're talking, and the woman says, but there's one God. And, and this guy says, oh, that's, that's all make-believe. That's all three. So all these different nations, they made up different gods, and, and this all just kind of make-believe, and that's not real. Uh, no, but there's one God, she says, and she's they kind of back and forth, and all of a sudden she just walks off and... I was like, that's kind of interesting, especially after what that guy said to me in the plane. And so I go, I'm heading back over to the, to the dairy section, and I'm, I'm getting some stuff out of the dairy section, and I think to myself, no, I need to go back and get some tortilla chips. So I swing back through that, lo- that aisle where the tortilla chips are, and there's that guy again, and he's talking to some other woman, and he's saying to her, no, there is no such thing as God. All these gods were made up by these different nations, kind of they're on their own imagination. It's just a fiction. Uh, and she's talking to him for a minute, and then she walks off, her hands throw it up, you know. And I think, this guy is like, this, this is like his place where he's hanging out and doing this. And so I, I thought, oh, well, I've got five minutes, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> so I, I, I look him in the eye, and I say, hi. And he kind of nods at me, and he walks by me. And so I go back to the place that stand and I say to my wife, I tell my wife what's going on, what happened with this guy at this potato chip section and her response to me is, is that like his pickup line down in the potato chip section at the grocery store? I said, I don't know, but it ain't working for him if it is. (laughs) Well, you'll probably not get attacked by an aggressive atheist in the potato chip section down at the Walmart or the Homeland around here, will you? But there is more subtle sabotage of our faith that goes on. It goes on at work, in the things that people want you to do, or in the way they look at you. It goes on in the community. It goes on in the family and what you're expected to be and what you're expected to do. There are subtle ways that we get pushed away from our Christian faith. So here's this guy, Donovan, and he's taking a stand for what's right, and, and the, the able trial goes, even goes up to the Supreme Court. This able guy is convicted, and he's sentenced to 30 years in prison. And the U-2 plane gets shot down. Gary Powers gets uh, 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 put in prison after uh, kind of a show trial in the Soviet Union. Um, and they want the Soviet Union wants to make an exchange, powers for Abel. <clears throat> and so they, the government sends Donovan over to West Berlin to go across to East Berlin to the communist side of Berlin and meet uh, with the people over there and try and negotiate this deal, a kind of a life for life exchange, just ransoming one for the other. And he goes over there and he finds out there's this college kid, Frederick Pryor, that's in there and he, he wants to get a two for one deal. We'll give you Abel, but I want not only powers, I also want this college kid prior. And so he's kind of worked to deal with the, where they can get powers out, but they're still messing around with prior. And, and he meets with the CIA chief there in the Hilton Inn in West Berlin. And he's talking with him. He says, you know, I think we've got this, prior, this powers thing straightened out. But the prior kids, you know, he's, we still haven't got that. And, and the CIA chief says, oh, forget about uh, forget about prior. Prior is irrelevant. Don't worry about prior. Their only focus is getting power out. And, and in this discussion between him and the CIA chief, it gets right down to what's really, really driving him. In three words, he states why he's going through all of this. 
I want you to listen to this conversation and listen to what Donovan says that really is why he's doing all this. Would you show that? So did, <clears throat> did you get why he was doing this? Three words, every person matters. And when I heard that, I thought, now that is a deeply Christian statement right there. Every person matters to God. God so loved who? The world. Every person matters to God. His son comes into this world in order to give himself as a ransom for many because every person matters. You remember what Jesus says about the, script, the scripture, about the story? The 99, he's, uh, the shepherd's got 100 sheep out in the wilderness, and there's 99 that he can account for, but there's one that gets lost. And what does he do? It says, Jesus says he leaves the 99 in the wilderness to go find the one who's lost because every person matters to God. Every person is equally valuable to God. I understand in our society, sometimes we're kind of like Animal Farm. Do you remember Animal Farm? The book, you know, where the animals take over the farm and they're going to set up an egalitarian state. And uh, the, finally, it's, it gets to the point where they say all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. That's the world. That's the world. This is God. Every person matters. Every person matters to me, he says. Now, in, a, in the kind of the end of this is the, this bridge you'll see here in, the front, in front of you, the bridge where the spike exchange, where the ransom takes place, where one goes to one side, the other one comes back to the other side, and uh, they're standing there, and Abel is standing with Donovan, and across the bridge is Powers, the U.S. Uh, pilot, and they're getting ready to make the exchange, and, and Donovan doesn't want it to happen because they haven't got that college kid out yet, and so Abel won't go across the bridge to the east until that college kid gets out. And he stands there with him and he finally goes across and as he's starting to go across, Donovan asks him, how will I know you're going to be okay? And, and the Abel says, well, if I, when I go across, if they embrace me, I'll be okay. But if they just show me the back door and put me in the car, I'm in trouble. Watch what happens. As I watched that scene, I thought, what a powerful image. What a powerful image of what Jesus does for us. He crosses the bridge from eternity and divinity to our humanity and our time. And why does he do that? So that we could cross the bridge the other way, to freedom, to forgiveness, to eternal life. Let's pray again. Lord, we give you thanks and praise that you are with us and you love us. We know that because we see that in every dime that we take the sacrament of communion. Uh, you are willing to cross the bridge and give yourself for us that we might have life. Lord, help us this day as we receive to remember how on the night in which you were betrayed, as you gathered with your disciples there in the upper room, you took the bread and you broke it and you gave it to them and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after the supper, you took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to your disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on this gifts of the bread and the wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Help us to have the courage to live like you to take a stand for what is right and true, and to be willing to sacrifice for you as you sacrificed for us. We ask these things in your name. Amen.